Just have had very different backgrounds of prior service. But in the post-World War II era, most have been backbench members or junior members of the WIP's office and not cabinet members. The Speaker and deputies, as well as the chairs of standing committees, have incredible powers. They can determine which portions, if any, of a bill may be amended and have discretion in limiting debate time. Unlike the U.S. House of Representatives, which tends to operate under the five-minute rule, limiting the time of speeches in committee and in committee of the whole, there are no formal time limits. In the House of Commons, the Speaker may, on rare occasions, interrupt a more formal vote and require a vote in which members stand in their places and are counted by the chair. The standing vote can be used instead of the House of Commons' more formal division when a small minority has persisted in demanding divisions. However, a division vote in the House of Commons can occur when demanded by a major party. And it's not unusual for House of Commons members to be sanctioned for speaking too long, and it's customary for a member to see the floor after losing the attention of the Commons. All right, so one last thing I'm going to look at in this episode is specifically look at votes of no confidence. And this inf- <laughs> and in the resources for this episode, I'm going to include a link to an article from HistoryExtra.com. There's an article written by Emma Mason that lays this out pretty well. And this is based on research from University of Exeter professor Richard Toy. So what does a vote of no confidence mean? When was a vote of no confidence first used? What does it say about different government systems? And which prime ministers in history have fallen victim to it? A parliamentary no-confidence vote is a motion moved in the House of Commons with the wording that this House has no confidence in government. It signifies that the government has lost the support of the Commons, the legislature, without which it is impossible to operate effectively. Retaining the confidence of the Commons is a core principle of the UK Constitution. The rules are outlined in the Fixed-Term Parliaments Act. It says, If a motion stating that this House has no confidence in HM government, His Majesty's or Her Majesty's government, is lost by the government and a new government with the support of a majority of MPs cannot be formed within 14 days, Parliament is dissolved, and an early general election is triggered. So this means that the basic principle is the government of a country has to have the confidence of the House of Commons. If the government has lost its majority, or does not have a reliable majority, this is the cue for either the government to fall and be replaced, or for a general election to be called. So the government then has a fixed period of time, 14 days, to win a vote of confidence or to call a general election. This is a period of political maneuvering in which the government party tries to prove that it can carry on and the opposition tries to supplant it. These votes were a fairly regular occurrence in the 19th century. But they haven't come around very often from 1900 to the president. Sir Robert Walpole agreed to resign in 1742 after losing a vote in the Commons that was effectively considered a motion of no confidence. And there's a distinction to be made between a formal vote of no confidence and a situation in which the government is looking to pass a key proposal or piece of legislation and to lose would suggest that they have lost the confidence of the House of Commons. And we're seeing all this right now in England with discussion of Brexit and how to implement that. In 1782, a motion censoring the government of Lord North for its conduct during the war with America was the first time a government was brought down by a vote of no confidence. Since then, there have been 20 government defeats on a vote of no confidence, all leading to either dissolution or resignation. Other notable incidents in modern history include the vote of no confidence in the conservative government of Stanley Baldwin in 1924, following the loss of his majority in the general election of December 1923. The election left the conservative government outnumbered in the Commons by Labour and the Liberals, and when Parliament met, it was defeated on the King's speech, that is, the government's program of policies. Baldwin resigned, and he was replaced with the Labour Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, who in turn lost a confidence vote that fall, and a further election followed. In 1940, the Norway debate occurred. This was a debate held on the 7th and 8th of May between MPs on Britain's failed campaign against German invasion forces in Norway. This turned into a vote of confidence on Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. On that occasion, the motion was simply the proposal that this House do now adjourn on which Labour called a division or vote. Chamberlain won, but he had a reduced majority, and with his credibility badly damaged, he resigned as prime minister two days later. 
He was replaced by Winston Churchill. Churchill invited the leaders of the Labour and Liberal parties to form a coalition government, with Chamberlain serving in Churchill's cabinet as Lord President of the Council. The last time a vote of no confidence was held was in 1979, which led to a general election. The Labour government, led by James Callaghan, faced a vote of no confidence on March 28, 1979, following a defeat over a referendum regarding Scotland and lost by just one vote. Following the vote, which was brought by opposition leader Margaret Thatcher, Callaghan was forced to call a general election, which was won by Thatcher's party. So opposition parties throughout history have put down votes of no confidence, but generally they tend not to succeed because members of the governing party see that the government's life is in danger, and so they circle the wagon, so to speak. They support each other. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Votes of no confidence were put down on two occasions in 1942 when the war was going pretty badly for Britain. Churchill managed to survive the votes. There was also a case that was unrelated to the conduct of the war. In 1944, the government opposed an amendment to its education bill, which would have introduced equal pay for female teachers. The government lost narrowly, and Churchill was furious. He went back to the House of Commons and said he wanted the matter to be treated as a vote of confidence and succeeded in getting the amendment reversed. He essentially browbeat the House of Commons into giving him his way. Another incident involves Margaret Thatcher, who faced down Labour's vote of no confidence in her government in 1990, even though she had resigned as Prime Minister earlier that day. On November 22nd, Thatcher announced her decision to stand down as Prime Minister after her cabinet refused to back her in a second round of leadership elections. But later that day, Labour's motion of no confidence was defeated. Nevertheless, John Major succeeded as Tory leader five days after Thatcher's resignation. Now, votes of no confidence were used before the 19th century, and I include Robert Walpole in 1742 and William Pitt the Younger in 1784, who avoided resignation by asking for a dissolution of Parliament and the ensuing election bolstered his government with a safe majority in the Commons, and the Duke of Wellington in 1830, who resigned the day after the vote. So in previous centuries, MPs were less blindly loyal to their party. In the 19th century, there weren't really career politicians in the sense that we have today. MPs who weren't paid weren't under the same pressure to remain loyal to in order to keep their jobs, and party discipline was less rigid. So 19th century governments were less stable than modern governments. You might have more th free thinkers. The argument could be made that today people are more beholden to their party and less likely to act out. But the functioning and machinery of government goes more smoothly now than it does in the past. So now, from the 20th century onward, governments have generally been unlikely to lose a vote of no confidence unless they are in a minority government. The three successful votes of no confidence, two in 1924 and one in 1979, were against minority governments. When Theresa May was in danger of a vote of no confidence in December 2018, it's because of her reliance on Northern Ireland's DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party. Had she not called a general election in 2017, from which she emerged with a minority government, she wouldn't have been so vulnerable. So getting back to the original question that Joyce had about votes of no confidence, it comes with advantages and disadvantages. And these advantages and disadvantages came with the motion to try to get rid of Theresa May in 2018. What it can do is get rid of a government that many think is not acting effectively, but it can increase turmoil because then you have to have a whole new election. And there's arguments over whether or not that increased turmoil is worth the ability to remove a government. And at least with the United States, when it was founded, the idea may have been that that increased turmoil could have very well destabilized the entire United States. So that's how we can look on whether or not you have a vote of no confidence and what it means with a government. All right. Well, thank you very much for the question. If any of you would like to submit questions to me, you're very welcome to do so. And I'll do my best to answer whatever you throw at me. All right. That is today's episode. As always, I want to thank the Knowlton's Rangers, 
especially our spy masters. Bill Ivey, Joyce Normant, Tyler from Colorado, Josh Reddick, Baron Fraser, Chris from Maine, Carl from Norway, Moondoggy from Ohio, Rick Knowlton, Vic and Irene, Mike from New York, Michelle, and Marlene. I'll explain what that is in a second. If you like the show and want to help it grow, there are four easy ways for you to do it. One, like and subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice. This helps spread the word about the show. Two, join our Facebook group. Here we can keep the discussion going about new episodes and you can talk about what you like and didn't like. And you can find this group if you just search for History Unplugged on Facebook. Three, we have an online store with t-shirts, phone covers, and other accessories featuring awesomely bad history puns that were crowdsourced by you, the audience. And you can find that if you go to tpublic, T-E-E, public.com and look for History Unplugged, or you just go to historyonthenet.com and look for our store there. Four, and this is really the best way to dive deep with History Unplugged, and that's to become one of the Knowlton's Rangers. If you know your American history, you know the Knowlton's Rangers were an elite spy and reconnaissance group in the American Revolutionary War, but it's also the name of the membership program of History Unplugged. You can join at three levels. If you join at the level of Scout, you can hear all the episodes of History Unplugged completely ad-free and get early access to new episodes, at least a week early. If you join at the Intelligence Officer level, you get special bonus episodes, like a 10-part series on the World War II hero Audie Murphy, a multi-part series called Ottoman Lives about different people in the Ottoman Empire, and a series called Rendezvous with Death that looks at biographical profiles of Americans who went to fight in World War I before America entered the war. The last level is Spy Master, where you get all that stuff, but you also get three hardcover history books, Forging a President, How the Wild West Created Teddy Roosevelt, Race to the Top of the World, Richard Byrd and the First Flight to the North Pole, and The Last Fighter Pilot, the true story of the final combat mission of World War II. Another bonus is you can choose a history topic for me to focus on for an entire episode that can go up to an hour, and I'll answer whatever question you have for me, and you get a shout out at the end of each episode. If you want to learn how to become a member of the Knowlton's Rangers, go to patreon.com slash unplugged. That's patreon.com slash unplugged. All right, well, that is all for my spiel. Thanks for listening to the History Unplugged podcast from ancient Greece to the Cold War and everything else in between. See you next time.